How y'all doing? Awesome. Let me get everything ready here because we're going to have some fun today. You guys want to have fun? Yeah. yeah. All right. Boy, I love this mic. Hey. So you got to watch the wind here. Thank you for that, by the way, because I get really hot. I guess Brett does too. I guess. Let me see. Okay, man. He wants to go another direction. Wing it, yeah. So, anyway, thank you all for coming. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to bring the word. And uh, I love this tent. I love this tent. It's a beautiful tent. The reason I love this tent is that um, when I was a kid, when I was in Idaho, I had a pastor, he was a, my uncle, Pastor Charles, and I had a lot of pastors in my family. When in Southern Idaho, we used to, back in the day, I'm going to give away my age here a little bit, but we had a lot of tents down in Southern Idaho, tent revivals. So our pastor would take us all around to these tent revivals in Southern Idaho, and we'd go, the music would be playing, you walk up to the tent, the music's playing, tambourines are shaking, the pastors are shouting, and there's sawdust all over the floor, and people are jumping around. I mean, it was just, as a kid, I was like eight years old, just seeing that, hearing that, I just, I just loved it. But what I, I remember the most about it is the smell. The smell of the sawdust. And I knew it was revival. And can I just tell you something what the Lord's been speaking to me? I smell sawdust. <laughs> revival is coming. I smell sawdust. So that's what I love about this tent. There's one thing i got to talk to you guys about because something's weird is going on at Rise Church. And maybe someone can help me out here explain it to me. As I was driving up, you know the three crosses out there yeah. on the rock? So I'm driving up, and I'm looking real close. There's four squirrels holding hands, praying. <laughs> so it's, what's going on there? So as I kept on driving up, there was four more squirrels there in the road greeting me. I go, man, this is really weird. So I finally pulled up, and I started to go in, and there was another squirrel there welcoming me in. So I was going, what is, so I talked to Lucinda, and uh, she told me, I guess the squirrels got into communion. The squirrels got into communion, they had some bread, and they had some wine, they had communion, and now I guess they're filled with the Holy Ghost, they're out there just, you know, so if God will anoint the squirrels to have revival, what about us, huh? Amen? All right. Well, thank you, Lord. You know what, before I get started here, I want to honor a couple of people here. You know, I gotta watch this window a little bit. Does anyone have a rock? Oh, I know what I do. I, I got it. Right here. I'll just pick mine. Anyway, I want to honor a couple of people here. And uh, and as I was preparing this message, and I hope you guys enjoy this. It's about testimony, and Daniel said it well. I mean, he just gave a testimony. This is a testimonial day, so you're gonna hear some testimonies today. And then I'm gonna bring three three points with te testimonies. Uh, ho hopefully it will touch your heart. But I want to honor two people here as, as preparing this message. The Lord spoke to me and said, hey, I want you to honor these two people today. I said, oh, okay. And, and by the way, it's not me honoring them, which I do honor them, and we all honor them, but the Lord spoke to me and said, I want to honor these two. So I said, okay, Lord, who are they? And it's Dr. Phil and Lynn. Could you stand? So the Lord spoke to me, and he just said that they want you guys to know that you've been faithful. If I can say it. You two have been faithful in this ministry for many years, and God wants you to know how proud he is of you and how you minister to families. You minister to sisters and brothers and your personal families. And Everything, every trial that's coming on, you have been there for us. You have been there for many others over, I don't know how many years, 30 years, whatever it is. These two have ministered in the Lord. And you guys have done so much. Their shoulders have carried tears and tears and tears. And the Lord is so proud of you. He wants you to know it. And he says, if you guys have an anointing, that's Phil, Dr. Phil, I always call him Dr. Phil, I call him Papa Phil. 
gives us such an anointing. And the Lord wanted me to tell you today that you are not done. Get ready. <laughs> you are not. God has another fresh anointing coming this year on you, and that's why the Lord wants to honor you. They also want to let you know, get ready, rise up. I'm going to make your shoulders stronger. I'm going to make your legs stronger. I'm going to make your spirit stronger. And Lord says that people are going to come your way, and those shoulders are going to be there to take on more tears and more hugs. Amen? Yes. So thank you, Lord Jesus, for this couple. Bless them, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. I just give you thanks for them, Lord, as we give thanks for them. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Anyway, guys, uh, we're going to have uh, some testimonies here, and uh, today is about testimonies like I told you. So uh, really listen, okay? I have, the Lord spoke to me to have three people give a testimony. I don't know who they were, but uh, told uh, Pastor Brett, and Brett, uh, Pastor Brett prayed about it, I prayed about it, and he picked them. So, it'll fly here. So, uh, anyway, I'm going to have these three people come up and give their testimony. They're going to get about three or five minutes. So, I really want you to just listen to what they have to say. Because Revelation 12, 11 says, you know, what does it say? You guys know that scripture? Yes, over by the blood of the Lamb and the word of the testimony. We have overcame Satan. And so, these testimonies are powerful. And uh, so, we want, we're going to start that today with that. And then I'm going to go jump right into uh, also three points that you have. And I have a testimony on each point, and I'll explain those. So first come up, I believe I have. Where is he at? There he is. Come up, my brother. We got Peter. Give it a hand for Peter. All righty, good morning. Like you said, three to five minutes, so I'm going to stick to this script. Uh, just so you guys know, I did everything I could to try to fall asleep early last night. Didn't happen until I wrote this down. So, here we are. <clears throat> For those here who do not already know me, my name is Peter Southard. To know a little bit of where I came from, my family situation was a bit unusual. And my growing up, I was on the brink of death a little more than the usual child. I went into kindergarten at the age of four, turning five in just three short months, and I weighed 22 pounds at that moment. By fifth grade, I was much healthier. My grandma managed to eat a lot bunch of fruit and vegetables, but I had weighed 45 pounds. Uh, this caused school kids to give me a fair amount of trouble, but I'm not going to get too much into details of that. Uh, just know that I refused to give up at that time what I saw as power to stop others. Uh, it was not an uncommon description of me before long for both adults and children to Describe me as a demon child. I didn't hesitate to hate, to be filled with rage, to manipulate or lie, or to cause great harm on anybody that I thought caused me any problems. Uh, I happened to be in Boy Scouts for quite some time, where I had a group of friends that had a similar lack of any morality, until a young man joined. And for reasons that I couldn't explain at the time, but I now see and know firm, firmly was the Holy Spirit. I refused to see my so-called friends bully or do anything of harm against him. I was drawn not just to him, but to his family as well. Little did any of us know the impact of these first meetings. Now I want to elaborate on something really quickly before I continue. Jesus did not just die for me. He died instead of me, so that I may be reborn without paying that price. And that I can be the child of God he desires me to be. That young man today, I have the pleasure of declaring, is my brother-in-law. <laughs> His eldest sister, my beloved wife. That family altogether is a God-sent blessing that without, I would not be here today. I can safely say that through these blessings that I did not deserve, that I have been redeemed, I cannot relate at all to the creature that I was once before. No longer will I bear or have any pride over a mantle of what's being called a demon child. Amen. And all credit. Is due to our Almighty God. That's right. Amen. 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 You know, I get how Jesus, God, He'll take what the world will give us a title, Demon Child. His name's Peter. Peter the Rock. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Peter. Peter the Rock. Amen. He's the Diamond Child. Oh, the Diamond Child. You got a new name, Diamond Child. I love that. Okay, we got our next testimony coming up. Sandra, come on up, girl. She's got some cheese to share. I'm excited about it. Is this great? Yeah. Okay, come on, get Okay, so my 
testimony. There's a lot. There's just so much that God has done in my life. So really what he, this is what he really wanted to get across. And so while I, uh, like many of you, there's so many things that I was before um, I was in Christ Jesus um, that were very unhealthy. The biggest crisis was my identity. That's what God wants to talk about today is my identity, is our identity. Um, and it has come from the blood of the Lamb. It comes from the word of our testimony. It comes from what Jesus did on the cross for us. So in the family I grew up in, I was taught to hide. I was taught to cover up. The spirit of shame was passed down, abandonment, rejection, all of the above. I learned to perform in order to be loved. I can do just about anything. I'm like MacGyver. I've learned to be that. You give me a Q-tip and a duct tape, and I'll make you a car. Like, I, there's not much I can't figure out. And I know that that's God did that. He's given me that gift. But what happens is those gifts, when we don't know the Lord, they, it manipulates, and the enemy manipulates it. And so he turned that into me striving constantly. Um, I struggled with who I was. Growing up, I was always at least a foot taller. You guys know I'm tall, right? I have some heels on, but just, you know, I'm six one all by myself. Um, so I was always a foot taller, and that was from day one. I was 10 pounds and almost two feet when I came out of my mom. So wow. it's just, that's just me. Um, I, uh, I had a very one, I had one thick eyebrow, <laughs> Coke bottle glasses, and buck teeth that you could probably see from the back of the room. Needless to say, I was very gawky and awkward. Um, and not to mention, I was a chunky girl for most of my life. There was a neighborhood girl. Um, she used to follow me around and call me Fat Sandy all the time. Aww. Yeah. So that was the enemy, really. Um, I got married the first time when I was 23 years old. I had zero idea of what marriage was. And my version of God was quite messy and certainly incorrect. Um, I actually remember singing... Some, I don't even know, it was in the 90s, like one of those songs um, about God and she and how, you know, people are like, God can be a girl and God can be this. And I was like, yeah, power to the woman. Like, woo! <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I accepted Christ in my life at the age of 27, and I have been married for four years. Um, that was the beginning of the pursuit. It's all about pursuit. Jesus pursued me from that day forward, and I didn't begin to recognize it for many years, but as I look back, it always has been about his pursuit of me. Always. I've been through divorce. I've been through abuse, many different types of abuse, uh, self-medicating, promiscuity, persecution, and there, the list goes on. I've been through it. I've protected myself. I've learned to protect myself. I could slice you with my tongue, up way and one down the other. Don't get in my face, because I will tell you who you are. That was who I was. God never left my side. That's my testimony. He has taught me Deuteronomy 31 and 6. says to be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. Whoever them is to you, whoever them is, don't be terrified. For the Lord your God goes with you. He shall never leave you or forsake you. I'm a new creation, Romans 8 and 1. And that no, that condemnation is no longer assigned to me. No longer. Zephaniah 317, that the Lord your God is with you. The mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but he will rejoice over you with singing. It took me many years to get that God delights in you. Terry, do you know that God delights in you? Even when man doesn't, God does. That's my testimony. Even when people were telling me, you're too big, you're too opinionated, you're too loud, you shouldn't say that. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. You, you're too this, you're too much. That was the enemy. God never says that to me. He sings over me. Uh, I have learned about producing fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. I have learned about God's friendship. Oh my gosh, you guys. He's the best friend that you will ever have your whole life. I learned to be alone with myself and alone with God and be very, very satisfied. I have learned that he loves to be with me and that his presence 
and that in his presence, nothing can overwhelm me except him. And I've learned that nothing that I have ever done or ever will do can make him love me any less. In fact, I feel his love grow for me every day. My life now, I recognize his voice. I get to speak and encourage people all the time with his heart. I've learned to overcome. I'm no longer offended or Hello there. I'm no longer offend offended or emotional. Well, sometimes I can be, but for the most part, I have self-control. Um, the old bloodline that was in me is no longer effective because I have rejected it, and now I receive Jesus, and all that comes from him is mine. It took me a long time to figure that out, you guys. Generational curses are not assigned to us anymore. When you're in Jesus, you don't have to fight that stuff. It's not about fighting the enemy and recognizing the enemy. It's about realizing how much God loves you and sitting in that. Sitting in God's love. And I just want to end with that. There's a, many, there's a lot of Christians. My husband and I are so passionate about this. There's a lot of Christians that are sitting in pews and are powerless. And Jesus didn't die for you to be powerless. Jesus didn't die for you that you have to fight all your old crap. That is a lie from the pit of hell that is being taught in all Christian places, and it's a lie. And I want to give you the truth with my testimony. That is the truth, that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. If Paul said that in a few chapters before that, he was persecuting Christians and not just persecuting them. We're talking chopping them up in little pieces. It's not a pretty, he, what he was doing to Christians was not pretty. Four chapters later, he's convinced that there's nothing that shall separate him. So my testimony is that I'm now convinced. I'm convinced. My husband and I are convinced. And that's our passion. So if any of you have a question about this after service, we would be more than happy to pray with you and to release that anointing over you because we really firmly believe that if God is for us, there's absolutely nothing that can be against us. Amen. 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 He is, man. He, he is, she said, he's my best friend. And he should be your best friend. All right, so we have our third testimony, Natalie. Where are you, young lady? There she is. Give a big hand for Natalie. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
and he went to get out of bed and his legs collapsed. And he couldn't walk. And I was like, that's it. We're going to the doctor and we're not leaving till they do an MRI. In one day, um, they discovered a mass that had broken his spine and that he had cancer. And not any cancer, but a non-curable cancer. Um, we were in the hospital for 12 days. They did seven, they fused seven discs. And we got out March 2nd, March 13th, COVID happened. March 15th, he started an eight month journey of chemo and radiation and um, had to go to City of Hope for a stem cell bone marrow transplant. Transplants are pretty trippy. They like bring you as close to death as they can get you and then they bring you back. Um, but that also means he has no immune system. So I don't have a relationship with my husband during that time, which was really, really weird. And I had all these points I wanted to share and then God said, get your journal. And so I'm gonna try and get through this, but this is raw and this is real and this is my head. On, we were at City of Hope for 18 days. Um, during the day I was all alone because he would be in the hospital and then during the nighttime, I couldn't go because of COVID and I couldn't leave the place because they tested me every week. So I just had to stay in this little place by myself with God and trip out. But at night, I was his caretaker. Because they would drop, and I had to give him, he was on like 13 medication. It was just pretty surreal. This is the day we got released. Father God, we did it. The three of us did it, together as a team. We truly are in this together. We finished well, Lord. We started February 19th of 2020, and we are two short days of 10 months of endurance, of fear, of humbleness, of a joy that you love us, of anxiety and numbness and panic and sadness, horrendous sadness, doubt, and everything in between. You have answered every single prayer. You have consoled, you have cried with us, you have laughed with us, you carried us. At one point during this, he spoke to me very clearly and he told me to be excited. Be excited. You have showered us in your love. You have grown us to be more like you to give grace even when it doesn't seem fair, to love unconditionally, to have strength, to do what seems to be impossible, to have joy in the midst of mental and physical pain. You have helped us appreciate things that we took for granted, appreciate quiet time. You have held us when we faced some of our greatest fears and have picked us up from pure and mental devastation. When physically and mentally we literally couldn't move, since February 19, 2020, our life has forever changed in an instance. Our life as we once saw it changed in minutes. We lost control of absolutely everything. Our jobs didn't mean anything. Our money didn't mean anything. Our marriage didn't even mean anything. Everything except God. We lost hope for a brief moments. You drew us back in. You held us tight. You wiped our tears. You held our hand. And you walked us through a storm when we didn't have the strength to take our first step. You gently covered us and led us through lifting us up every time. Every time we tripped, every time we stumbled, and every time we fell, you lifted us up. But guess what, Lord? The lightning and thunder have stopped. The violent showers have been reduced to a mere sprinkle. 
and we're going to take our umbrellas down and dance. We're going to dance with you. Thank you, Lord, for this journey. Thank you for this experience. Thank you for this opportunity to get to love you on a new level. We are yours. Use us. In Jesus' name. And I just want to end with Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to try and see this. When you're stuck between a rock and a hard place, but now, God's message, the God who made you in the first place, the one who got you started, don't be afraid. I rede I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you won't go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end. Because I am God, and I'm your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. I paid a huge price for you. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. Sorry, I'm almost done. But I hit it. That's how much I love you. Ugh. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. I'd trade the creation just for you. So don't get discouraged. And if you do get discouraged, don't stay there. Because he can take you through anything. Anything and everything. Thank you. so much for his testimonies, uh, and that's what God's all about. I mean, he's there in every storm. He's there where we're at. So I'm going to share with you some scriptures. I'm going to share you uh, just uh, some testimonies, and, and hopefully we can take some of this that I share today, and we just run with it, that we run with it. God wants us to run with his word. He doesn't want us to stop. He doesn't want us to take a break. He wants us to grab a hold of his word and run with it. Amen. So uh, I put the title of this, The Power of God's Son, because I recognize and I know the power, and every testimony you hear, or heard here today is about the power of God's Son. The number one point is uh, power in the name of Jesus. There's power just saying the name of Jesus, right? There's power in saying his name, calling out his name. I'm going to put this window up here. Should have done an iPad, huh? There we go. So Jesus wants us to call on him when we're in trouble. And has anyone been there? Yeah, can I see just some hands? Uh, you've, you've had to call on his name, right? So a lot of us have. We have to call on his name. We have to call on the name of Jesus. I know I have my wife, my family, and... There's uh, these three short testimonies I'm going to give you happened over 30 years ago on uh, calling the name of Jesus, the power in the blood, and the power in the cross. And Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is saved. Amen? Yeah. Everyone, not some of us, but everyone that calls on the name of the Lord is saved. Who calls on the name of Jesus is saved. <clears throat> so about 30 years ago when I, I learned the power of his name when I was a young Christian. And uh, me and my wife and family decided to go down to the beach and we we're going to go swimming, just relax and have fun. It was just going to be a, just a nice, wonderful, beautiful day. And so we went down there and uh, my sister was with us. And I forget who else. We were all there together and we were on the beach there. And my sister had jumped in the water, my sister Michelle. <clears throat> she wanted to go for a dip. I think it was in September. And uh, as she was out there, we were talking, and my wife looks out and goes, uh, Michelle looks like she's swimming on her back. I go, swimming on her back? Looks like, I go, oh yeah, she is swimming. Look at that. I, go, I was like, you know, and she goes, no, 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 she's, she looks like she's in trouble. I go, nah, she's just, I went, no, she is in trouble. So we ran out there right away, jumped in the ocean, and, and did not realize when we got out to the ocean we were in a riptide. 
Has anyone ever tried to swim on a riptide? Is it that easy? No. Not easy at all. And we had heard about the riptides going up along Carlsbad coast. There's, they had a lot of them there. And so my sister was out there, so we swam out to her. And Shemaine was on one side, my beautiful wife was on one side, I was on the other. And we began to um, swim out of the riptide. You know, and I looked up, and we weren't going nowhere. And I don't know about you. I, know I was. I had a fear of drowning. I did. You know, I almost drowned once, and it's, it's not a, you know, not a good feeling. And so we were just going and trying to go, and my sister begins to almost pass out on top of that. So I'm going, oh my gosh, Lord help us! I'm going, Lord help us! Lord help us! And we just keep on swimming, keep on swimming. I, I look out, and we were getting further away. So right when that happens, I'm already going, oh my gosh, oh my Lord, my leg cramps up. And so now I've got one leg, my arm around my sister, and I'm trying to, and I'm not, I'm not feeling like, oh my gosh. I, I saw a vision, all three of us going under, because we're still in the riptide. Now I don't know about you, but I knew that there's only one thing I could do. I was looking for the lifeguard. I, was, I think I turned my wife once, yell for the lifeguard, or yell for the lifeguard, and, and we didn't see one. And then there was a point that just came, I thought, well, I'm getting ready to go under because I, you know, I have no more strength. So from the top of my lungs, out there in the water, I'm not kidding you, it was just like this. Jesus! Just like that. As soon as I did that, I touched the sand. And I went, you know, honey, go, go, we gotta go, we gotta go. So we got on the sand, we got to the to the to the shore, and just fell down and and just laid there for I don't know how long. But I was just like, then you're so into it, you're scared, all that stuff's going on. Then I, had, then I stopped and I went, wait a minute, we were that so far out, we were in the riptide, and how did we get what the. I don't, and, you know, it says the Holy Spirit, he goes, there's power in my name, Jesus. Whenever you call on my name, I am there. No matter what the situation is. Sometimes it may be, Jesus, I just need you. It could be that, and he's there. Sometimes it's, Jesus, where are you? And he's there. Sometimes, we had a tough year last year, right? Me and my wife, we had a tough year last year going through some of the stuff that she's going through. But there's times that we've had and people go through where it's you're hitting your steering wheel of the car and going, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So what I want you to take from that is wherever you're at, no matter what's going on, just there is power in the name of Jesus. If you call on his name, he will be there to save you. Amen? Amen. And I believe that. And I, I, since that time, I took a whole, different, a whole different meaning of the name of Jesus. And I call on that name all the time. Because he will be there. So all of you in this room, no matter what happens, no matter what's ahead of you, just call on his name. Natalie? She knows. Yes. There <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Call on it, shout on it, whisper it, but there's power in his name. The demons tremble when you say his name. Amen? Amen. Point two, power in the blood. I want to talk a little bit about the power in the blood. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance to the riches of God's grace. There's definitely power in his blood. Revelation 12, 11, we talked about earlier. And they overcame, we overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of the testimony, by his blood. There's power in his blood. And I want to talk a little bit about the blood of Jesus and the power in that blood. You know, when Jesus hung on that cross and the blood was poured out, and we do communions and we take our bread and we take the communion and we, you know, we remember what he went through. But sometimes, you know, when you just sit there and you really... Think about it. And you really see him on that cross and the blood dripping from his feet, dripping from his hands. That there is power in that blood that he poured out for us. 
So I want to tell you another little story again 30 years ago that God showed me that there is power in his blood. Maybe in a different way than you expect. So <clears throat> three years ago I went through a horrendous divorce and I was married and I had two kids, seven years old and four years old. And I'm not, not going to go into details of that, but my wife uh, left me uh, for someone else. And so they ended up in another home and uh, with my two boys. And at that time, I was a Christian, and my ex was a Christian. And uh, these two little boys I had, seven and four, I loved them dearly. I would pray with them every night at their bedside, at their bunk beds. We'd get out together, get on our knees, and begin to pray. And I'd pray with them, and I did that every night. And so I enjoyed that, I loved that. Until the one day when the, the judge ordered me out of the house Christmas week. That was a rough week, really rough week. And <clears throat> after I was over out of the house, and after we went through everything, I was able to, you know, to have to work out how you can visit, you know, uh, each with the, with the kids. And I, I had them Tuesday nights and uh, Friday nights and Saturday, so I had them like two nights a week. And then I just want to let you know, it killed me. It killed me to know that they were living in a house with another man I did not know. So I had to really trust God. I really had to trust, you know, what was going on there. Some nights I couldn't sleep at night because I worried about my two little boys. You know, what's going on? What's happened to them? This man's not a Christian. She's off in a whole other plane, and they're not thinking straight. Lord, please pray for my, please help my boys. So I knew where they lived, the house they were living at, and where I worked at. Every night or every day when I drive past, I would reach out my hand. The Lord told me to start doing this. He says, reach out your hand, point to where they're living at, and pray the blood of Jesus. Pray, pray my son's blood over them. So that's what I did. I don't know how many, probably for a month, I do that all the time. Lord, just pray the blood of Jesus over Chris and Chad. Just be with them. Protect them, Father. I know that you're going to protect them and cover them, Father. So I just pray the blood of Jesus over them. So I did that for a month. Tuesday night came, it was our Tuesday night to get together after a month of this, and uh, again, seven and four, took them to McDonald's, you know, kids want to go to McDonald's, right? So I had them that Tuesday night, we went to McDonald's, and we were sitting there, and we are eating, and my seven-year-old Christian, we're sitting there eating, and he goes, Papa, they call me Papa, he goes, Papa, I had a dream last night. I go, oh, you did? And they're eating their fries, and I'm eating their fries, and he goes, yeah, he goes, oh. He goes, it was weird, Papa. I go, it was? He goes, well, tell me. He goes, well, in my dream, I woke up in our bedroom, and when I was in the bedroom, I looked around, and there was red everywhere. He said, oh, red? What do you mean red? Like, did they paint the room? And he goes, I don't know. They were, it was red. And I got up, and I went to get Chad up, and he was all red. I go, all red? Well, we, we, you know, well, that's weird. Where's my, can I take a little sip here? I got allergies. So I said, that is, that's, that's wow. I said, was that it? And he goes, no, I got up and I walked in the bathroom and I turned on the light and it was red, it looked like red paint everywhere. Red paint. I go, yeah, he said, it looked like blood. And I went, it looked like, I lost it. <laughs> Fries came out of my mouth. <laughs> and started crying, my son, what's wrong, Papa? And, yeah, what's wrong, Papa? Why are you crying? And I said, nothing's wrong, you have a, nothing. And the Lord spoke. He said, I've answered your prayer. They're covered by my son's blood. And they are going to be okay. From that time on, I knew the power of God's blood. But guess what? These boys are doing great. And they're doing wonderful. And they're married. And I just thank the Lord for that. But there is power in the blood of Jesus. And it's all right. It's all right to pray sometimes and plead the blood of Jesus over a situation that's going on. It's all right to pray 
and plead the blood of Jesus over a sickness or whatever's going on. It's all right to do that. It's all right to say the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus because the demons go running. Sickness will go running because there's power in that name. There's power in his blood. Amen? The last point, one of my favorite points, is power in the cross. In Colossians 2.14 it says, Having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed against us. And listen to this part right here. I love this part. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. I'm wearing a cross today. A lot of people... Wear crosses, right? A lot of people, a lot of people just wear crosses. They don't even know what the cross is about. But there's really, there's, there's a lot of power in the cross, what Jesus did for us. You know, and, I, and as I'm sharing today, I remember at the beginning of the year, I was, uh, when I started the new year, I was praying and asked the Lord, what, what, what's in store, what's going to be happening? And, and you know, and then I minister a lot to, in different churches, and we minister the church we're at, and I minister in the workplaces I'm, I'm at. And he says, uh, and I just felt the Lord press upon me. He goes, this year, I want you to preach the cross. Preach nothing but the cross in my son's name. And I just told the Lord I will because there is power there and people's lives will be changed. So the cross, which leads us to a third testimony, it kind of really showed me the power of God's forgiveness and the power of what he did on the cross for us. And the whole... Another different way. This is the last one I had for the last point. So, I was uh, 13 years old. My brother was 11. My sister was 2. And this, we lived in Pioneer Side Home. And then, make it short, my dad left us, took the car, took everything. It was just me, mom, my brother, my little sister. And as a 13-year-old, I felt the weight on my shoulders of being the man of the house. So it was uh, pretty heavy duty. And I wasn't very happy with what my dad did. So on for the next 30 years, we had kind of an off and on relationship. And uh, I hated him, hated him at times and uh, some of the stuff that you know, he had done to us and abuse and other things, abuse to my mom. And so I didn't have a lot of, a lot, a lot of love for him. And, uh, you know, and as I be began to grow as a Christian, and I was sitting in an you know, atmosphere like this, and the preacher was talking about forgiveness, and I go, yeah, and we need to forgive, you know, different people that we hold, you know, judgment against. So I said a prayer, Lord, you know, forgive my dad, and just help him. Amen. And just walk off. You know, I'm good. I'm good. So as years went on, a few phone calls, I finally quit talking to him. Got tired of the late calls, two in the morning, being drunk and talking to me and keeping me up. And just, you know, got tired of listening to it. Didn't want to go see him anymore. So one night I'm sitting there in San Marcos at the table at 8 o'clock at night, just minding my own business. But, you know, you ever notice when you're minding your own business, God shows up and just, what is that? Can you kind of explain that to me? I go, hey, hey, hey. And, you know, and he taps you on the shoulder. Anyway, I turn, and you know when God's speaking to you. I just turned to Matt. I want you to call your dad. Oh, why don't I call him? <laughs> it's, it's his truck. I'm not going to call him. He's probably drunk. He's probably drinking again. He's probably, you know, no, I'm not doing that. Just laughed about it. I went about my business. He goes, call your dad. A little firmer. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? And I said, no. <laughs> because I didn't want to call him. Then it got even better. He goes, I want you to call your dad, and I want you to tell him you're sorry. Really? I, so I, had a, I stopped and went, you want me to tell him that I'm sorry? I, I had this whole fight with God. It happened, you know. Okay, God, you, you don't know, like I did, like he doesn't know, right? <laughs> like he doesn't know. He was the one that left us. We didn't have any food in the house. He left us. He's the one that kept us up every night after he came home from a bar and kept me and my brother up and showing us how tough to be and pitching our skin and learning about pain. 
He's the one that caused all this, and you want me to say, I'm sorry to him? What, what are you talking about? That doesn't make sense to me at all. You've got to be kidding me. So I ran and raved for quite a while, and God said, call your dad and tell him you're sorry. So I gave up. So okay, this is crazy, Lord. What am I doing? It's crazy. So that was the night that God took me to the cross. Unforgiveness. So I want you to think about it. Forgiving others. I called my dad. That's how old I am. <laughs> and he answered the phone. I go, hey, Dad. He goes, well, hey, son. You know, he wasn't, wasn't drinking. It was like 8 o'clock at night. He goes, how are you doing? I go, well, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. My mind's going, okay, I'm going to say this. I'm going to fight it the whole time. And then at an instant, when I was about ready to not, I felt the Holy Spirit calling me. Just come all the way. I just felt this peace. I went, hey, Dad, can I talk to you a second? He goes, yeah. I just want to tell you something. You know, we had rough times and been rough years and all the stuff that's going on with mom and us and everything. You know, I just, I just want to tell you that uh, I'm sorry for all that. This is, all you, this is all you heard. Then all of a sudden I heard crying. Then I heard bawling. Then I started to bawl. Then we both started to cry together on the phone. I don't know how long we cried, but after that night was over and when we hung up, we started calling each other, talking to each other. I had married uh, Shemaine, you know, he was not really interested in any of the, the Jesus stuff. But boy, when I gave him a, one of the songs my wife wrote and sent it to him, he said, son, that song put goosebumps all down my back and the back of my head. He wasn't even saved. Then we ended up praying and praying for each other. He was telling us he'd be praying for praying for us. And uh, and I was the one that had to say I was sorry. But what the Lord taught me through that was this. He says, Matt, that night when I had you do that, number one, good job, you obeyed me. Number two, you faced the cross in another way you hadn't faced the cross before. Because when my son was on that cross, and they did all the things they did to him, like your dad did to you, Jesus hung there and saw all that. And he said, Lord, forgive them. For they know not what they do. So, so that night when you said sorry to your dad, I used the Holy Spirit for you to say forgive him. Or not, he does not know what he's done and what he's caused. He says, I'm going to do the rest. And so as I did that, I had to take, as it says in the scripture here, we took all that and nailed it to the cross. I had to take my pride that night and I nailed it to the cross. I had to take all those past thoughts and all the bad, what, everything went on, I had to nail it to the cross. And the Lord taught me a big lesson that night in forgiveness that there is power in forgiveness, this man that was a drunk and the abuser, by saying, I'm sorry, broke him. And God healed him. And we came together again as father and son. So I don't know how many of you out there have faced different people that you have had fights with or arguments with or whatever was going on. I, I ask you to go. Make that phone call, make that visit, and make it right. Because God will do it. He will change it. He can do it. He absolutely can do it. So today when you walk away from this, remember the power of Jesus' name. Call on him. Remember his blood, the power in his blood. Plead, decree his blood. And number three, the cross. It means forgiveness. Sometimes not in the way that we might know. But you hold through Jesus Christ, through you, through your hearts, 
you have his power through you to forgive. To forgive that father, to forgive that sister, to forgive, forgive that brother. Whoever it is, you have the power of forgiveness in your hand and your heart through Jesus and through the cross and through his blood. I just want to say a prayer right now and, and then I'll turn over the service to Daniel. But Lord, I just thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you for this day of testimony, Father. I thank you for the testimonies that we heard today, Father. That we take them, we cradle them in our hearts, we apply them to our lives and realize, Lord Jesus, you are Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, you are our best friend. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for that blood that was poured out, Lord. Poured out on us, Father. For there is power in your blood. And there's power in your blood today, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we plead that blood, Lord, over our families, over our loved ones, over this sickness, Father. I believe, Father, Lord, as revival breaks out this year, which I know it's going to, Father, there's sawdust smelling in the air, Father. Different churches are rising up like this one here, Lord God. There's going to be many mighty things happening, miracles happening, Father. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you for the cross, Lord, and the power in the cross. And remember that cross. Remember what you did. And we will never, ever forget. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.